In the previous lecture, we talked about how to derive pi terms, and as we did the final step, I mentioned that there are two different ways of, of actually putting together those pi terms. In the previous lecture, we looked at using an intuitive method. In this lecture, we'll look at using a linear equations um, technique to solve this. Okay. So the general form for our dimensionless numbers can be put in this format. So if we have three pi's that we're solving for, we have our repeating variables which appear for each of the pi's. So these are represented here as a1, a2, a3. And they appear in both repeating variables, but they have different exponents depending on what's needed in that variable. In addition, each variable has the non-repeating variables, a4, a5, a6, which only appear once in each variable, and they are raised to the power of 1. So mathematically what we need to do is we need to evaluate these exponents. We need to solve for these exponents such that the units cancel out. So for example, with the problem that we've been working, We've got little d as a function of five variables. I pick three repeating variables, and I'm left with three non-repeating variables. I then can set up my pi 1 in this format. So I take my repeating variables, big D, mu, and v. They're raised to some exponent. We use variables for those exponents. And that's what I'm trying to solve for is what is x1, what is y1, and what is z1. And then little d also appears in that equation raised to the power of 1. You can do the same thing with pi 2 and the same thing with pi 3. So these have rho and sigma in them and then also the repeating variables with the exponents. If we then extend that to the units, those exponents are then carried through the units and we can rewrite this equation yet again in terms of the units. And we do that for all three pi's. Now to be dimensionless we must get those units to multiply to 1. So let's go back to our pi 1 which is of this form and it's got these units. So in order for us to find a dimensionless number, all I've done is set these units equal to 1. If these all equal 1, then I've come up with a dimensionless number. Now, to get those equal to 1, I can actually tease this apart into three different equations. Because what I really need to do is get all the L's to cancel out, all the M's to cancel out, and all the T's to cancel out. So if I can do those three things, then I've also satisfied my problem. So to make this easier to solve, that's what I'm going to do is tease out the L's, the M's, and the T's. And as you can see, here is the equation for the L's. That has to equal 1. M only appears once, and it's M raised to the power of Y1, so that one has to equal 1. And then the t's appear twice, and that has to equal 1. Another way of looking at this is to get those variables to, multi to equal 1 if you get the exponents to add to 0. So you have to go back to some of your mathematical rules here. If you remember um, a variable raised to an exponent times that variable raised to an exponent is the same as adding the exponents, right? And a variable raised to the power of 1 is equal to 0. So using those rules, we can rewrite the equations in this form. So all we have to do now is solve for those exponent values, x1, y1, and z1. So rewriting those three equations in this form, we now end up with this, which is a very simple system of uh, three, three linear equations, three unknowns, and we can solve. In fact, in this case, y1 is already solved. It equals 0. 
we can plug that into the third equation and we get z1 has to equal 0. Then we can take those up to the first equation and we get x1 equals minus 1. So now we've solved it. We can plug into our initial equation. Pi 1 is d to the minus 1 times mu to the 0 v to the 0 times d. In other words, pi 1 is little d over big D. Now, I don't like this technique, to be honest, but the book um, teaches it as the primary method, and um, it does have its uses. In this case, you can see we had to do an awful lot of work just to get to the pi that says little d over big D. That pi should be fairly obvious from the start, and, and I think this was too much work to get there. The other problem I have this, with this is it's kind of tedious and it's easy to make a simple math error as you're working with all these pluses and minuses and x1s and y1s. So it's, it's easy to make, a stake, to make a mistake. On the other hand, sometimes the intuitive method, which I taught first, is tricky. And um, sometimes the pi's are not easy to solve. It's not easy to get the variables to cancel out. In that case, this would be a good technique to take, certainly, because this, this assures you an easy solution, but you have to be very careful because it's very easy to make a mistake and then you'll end up with the wrong number. All right, let's do it for the other two pies. We can do it a little bit faster than what I showed initially. I was sort of deriving it as I, showed, as I solved the first pi. As we do the second pi, it should go faster. So we write the general formula for pi 2, which is our repeating variables, raised to unknown exponents times our non-repeating variable. We then put in our units and carry through the exponents. And then in order for it to cancel out, the units for each letter, or for each reference dimension, have to add to 0. So now we can write those equations. For length, we work through the equation. Length is raised to the x2. It's also raised to the minus y2. It's raised to the z2. And it's raised to the minus 3. So those things shall add up to 0. For mass, it appears twice. It's raised to the y2. And it's raised to the 1. That has to add to 0. Time appears twice as well. It's, it's raised to the minus y2 and to the minus z2. That has to add to 0. So we've got our three linear equations. Now all we need to do is solve. You can see right off the bat y1 equals minus 1. You can plug in that into the third equation. And we get z2 equals 1. Those go into the first equation. And as you work through it, you'll find out that x2 equals 1. So. We've got our solution to pi 2. It's rho dv over mu. Pi 3 is the same approach. Um, we use our general form. We take those exponents and apply them to the units. We then write linear equations for each of the variables, or each of the reference dimensions, rather. So we work through all the times L appears. We come up with this equation. We look for all the m's, and we come up with this equation. Then we look for all the t's, and we get this equation. We then have to solve that. Again, the second equation, equation is easier to solve. The third equation is then easier to solve. And then we can plug those into the first equation and come up with a final answer. So that gives us our pi 3. So again, this is an alternative approach. You can you can use either way, either the intuitive method or this method, and you can even mix them. You can even do a couple of variables with the intuitive method, and if you get stuck on one of them because it's really hard, then maybe you switch over to this method, and that's fine. So I encourage you to practice both of them. On the quizzes, I won't specify which one you have to use. You just have to get to the right answer either way. It's fine with me.